How's everybody doing? It's Friday. Thanks for joining us. It's our last day together. It's going to be a good day too. So thanks for taking time. We've we've made some progress over the last five day, or four days, I should say. Today's day five, this whole week. Before we get going, I just would love some feedback from everybody here. I, my, my, curious, my curiosity is, what's been your favorite day? Is there a topic that you've enjoyed the most? Is there something that we've talked about that was a surprise to you? Or is there something that you'd like to know more about? Any kind of feedback along that regard, I would love for you to share it with me in the chat. And so we know not only to how to improve these in the future, but also to know where we should spend more time focusing um, and, and what we can do to help you learn more. So today's going to be really exciting um, because we get to talk about just some helpful tips and tricks along the way that you can incorporate into your daily life. And then we'll also talk about all of those frequently asked questions that we've seen and, and respond to your questions today. And where do we go from here? So pretty cool, pretty exciting. Um, protein and exercise was, was one. I, yeah, those are probably my two favorite things, nutrition and moving. So those are my, my two favorite days for sure. Um, we'll jump into this and please keep commenting on the chat on what your favorite things were every day. Thanks, Carol. You're nice. And, um, let us know what you like the most. Okay. Let me share my screen and we'll jump into our final day together. Soon as I click on the right thing here. And there we go. Okay, so helpful hacks, frequently asked questions. We're going to just start right off with our metabolism hacks. That way we have time to answer all of your questions. So, and, and some of these will be in response to the questions that we received. They just were, were some of the things we we're going to talk about. And they answer some of the questions as well. So one of them is one way to boost that metabolism, fuel the fire is start the day off moving. So we talked about how exercise is the best in the morning. And one of the questions was, well, what does that mean for breakfast? Should I exercise before I eat or after I eat? You should definitely exercise before you eat. <laughs> Excuse me. If you can, and you're going to do your full exercise routine in the morning, it's great to do it first thing before you shower, before you get ready. We're before you eat, we're moving. Essentially, we're sending the body that signal. Hey, today's going to be a productive day. We're going to need more energy. We're going to need that fire to be stoked higher. So it increases that resting metabolic rate before we do anything. First signal we send movement. Um, even if you normally exercise later in the day, it's still a good idea to start the day off getting your body moving. Even if it's 10 minutes of movement to get that heart rate up, whether that's Going up and down your stairs, going through some yoga or some body weight exercises. Those are all really beneficial. The next one is when you're done and you're ready to get started for your day, turn on a cold shower. Really jumpstart that system. If you don't want to, uh, if you don't want to cold shower the whole time, what I recommend is end your shower in cold. And there's a lot of cool research between the hot and cold. You can cycle between hot and cold during your shower. A lot of times I'm, I just don't want to take the time. I want to be in and out of my shower. So I usually will just jump in as it's warming up, get that first cold shock out of the way, and then end 30 seconds to a minute on cold. A great way to stimulate the body. In fact, one of the research articles about cold exposure looked at 14 degrees Celsius. So, I mean, we're talking 57 degrees. It's cold, but not like ice plunge, right? It increases metabolism by 350%. Now this study looked at, I think it was one hour of exposure in this water. So we're not going for 350%, right? We don't want to take an hour of a cold plunge every single day, but the, the reasons why it works, why we're increasing perfusion to the muscles, why we're decreasing, how we're decreasing inflammation, helping support muscle repair, all of those same things um, apply to a shorter exposure, even if it's 30 seconds to a minute at the end of your shower. The other thing that really seems to work really well is movement after eating, especially after that last meal of the day, because our body's starting to rev back down. Our body is like, Hey, it's we're the sun's going down. We're, we're getting all of those signals from our hormones that it's starting to slow down. So a 
20 minute walk after dinner uh, can, can change everything. And by walk, I should have put walk in quotes. That can be anything playing with kids, going outside and, and playing with the dog or doing the chores, vacuuming, whatever you want to do. If we're moving, what we've seen in the research from this is we see an 18% reduction in the serum fat levels in the blood. So from compared to people who were sitting and people who are standing. So movement helps promote digestion. It helps promote absorption, which like we've talked about when we're talking about cellular health, all of those things are going to support the cells. So movement, a pre mealtime snack. Now this, this recommendation is from the research and, and, um, Dr. Uh, Michael Geiger, he's the he's a doctor that talks a lot about nutrition. In fact, he runs a website called nutritionfacts.org, which is a, an amazing resource. Uh, lots of cool uh, videos there and content that you can look at. A pre-meal snack. The question that he raises when he after he read this research was, hey, how many calories does an apple have? And I know we've talked about eating protein first. This research article looks at, at apples. How many, how many calories does an apple have? And the answer was, well, it depends when you eat it. If you eat it 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes before you eat, it could have negative 200 calories because the research shows that if we have a 100 calorie snack before we eat about that 10 to 15 minute mark, we eat 300 calories less during the meal. So if you remember your mom and you can hear her telling that you don't eat that right now, you'll spoil your dinner. She was absolutely right. We eat less when we snack before dinner. So what does that mean for protein? Does that mean that it would only work with an apple? There's a number of reasons why I think the apple works because we're, we have a high fiber content and we see that a high water content, both of which contribute to satiety, which we'll talk about. But uh, in fact, that next uh, metabolism hack, right? Water content is the highest predictor of satiety in any food. The, the three big contributors to satiety is water content of your food, fiber, and protein. So even though this research is saying, hey, we, we followed an apple and we eat less if we eat an apple before meals. By the way, the same, the same holds true with starting your meal with a salad. You eat less of whatever's to come. So if we're worried about portion control, decreasing calories, that's a great way to do it. But the take home here is that third benefit would be, or the, the third most satiety, most filling food is protein. So we could still have like a hundred grams or a hundred calories of a protein source, not a hundred grams. That's a lot of protein. You wouldn't be hungry at all. So you could have like a small handful of nuts where you're going to get fat and protein or something along those lines. Sometimes I just snack on some, um, Pumpkin seeds, nuts and seeds seem to work pretty well and to get a little bit of protein, but also the fat content. Remember, we just want to keep it in that 100 calorie range so that we're not overdoing it. So obviously you're going to eat a lot less nuts than the size of an apple. So remember that though, when you're looking at filling your plate, water content is the highest predictor, which I thought was pretty cool. We also had a question about, hey, what about all this fad stuff about uh, cold water, drinking ice water or lemon juice and apple cider vinegar. Is there research behind it? Yes, there is. Um, cold water, probably not as much as, as some of the other ones. Well, actually, if I had to put it in order, I'd probably say apple cider vinegar, cold water, lemon juice. Lemon juice has so many other benefits that it wasn't like directly related to weight loss like, like some of these others. Essentially, cold water, you, your body just has to burn energy to warm it back up so that your body can use it. It's not going to be a huge game changer. And if drinking freezing cold water decreases the amount of water that you drink during the day, don't do it. I, there, I have a number of patients that like drinking room temperature water. In that case, I would say it's not worth the, the trade-off because we go back to that consistency and frequency. If you drink more with the warm water, do it. Apple cider vinegar, however, does show with all other variables accounted for as much as possible in like a randomized blind control placebo study, six tablespoons of apple cider vinegar a day had a decrease in weight over people who did not use it. So that could look at, you could do two teaspoons per meal if you're eating three meals a day. I like to start my day off with, with apple cider vinegar and do just a tablespoon in some warm water. And I add the lemon juice right to that concoction 
because it makes the apple cider vinegar taste better to me. I don't like the taste of it. But not only is that a nice calming effect, it stimulates my, my um, digestion right off the day. Um, I don't use cold water for that. I use warm water since it, we've, we've been fasting overnight, right? So it's just a little bit less of a shock to the, to the body. So um, apple cider vinegar would be a great one. The other one is wall off your calories. And by that, I mean, let's make your body work for the calories that you have to eat. Um, so plants, plants have a cell wall. Other calories don't. So if we want to make your body work to get those calories, we want to include plant sources in the diet. And this is something that, that just as well as everything else, this is something that's supported in the research that, um, and the wall off your calories, that, that phrase comes from this research, but it is Dr. Geiger that, that coined that phrase, I believe to say, Hey, if we have to work to lose weight, let's make our body work to get the calories that it needs in a good way, right? And it's not like we're sending in toxins and making it sift through what it needs and what it doesn't need. We just increase the requirements. And if you'll notice, a lot of these are increasing a number of things like fiber content's going to go up, water content's already going up. So we're decreasing that sedentary behavior because of our bathroom breaks. A lot of these walk hand in hand. We're walking after dinner. So we're increasing and, and we're creating a physically active lifestyle. All of these things blend into so many different um, categories in our health, which is why it's so important and why we've spent the last four days talking about so many different areas that play a role in metabolism, because they're all so interconnected. The other cool thing that I like about the research is, and I didn't list these studies, but um, when we're talking about spices and, and um, flavor there's a number of, of spices outside of, of things like apple cider vinegar that do show uh, significant weight loss compared to other things like ginger, garlic, black pepper, uh, black cumin, cumin itself. These are all things that have been shown in the literature to help stimulate metabolism, to help reduce weight. So just another plug to remember to be um, diverse in the spices that you use in your cooking. Okay. Oh, Lori's got, Lori, go ahead. Hey, Brandon, sorry, my confusion. I typed in six tablespoons, but your slide shows six teaspoons. My error, everybody. Oh Forgive yeah, me. sorry. Six no, teaspoons. No, my bad. <laughs> thanks for, yeah, thanks for clarifying that. So six teaspoons a day, essentially almost like two tablespoons. I think it was, yeah, somewhere right around there. So um, yes, thank you. Okay, let's jump into your questions. We're just going to kind of walk through this like, like on the days that we talked about. So we're going to start with day one. One of the big questions was, can I gain muscle while eating healthy? What do I do? Like, I, how can I get my protein requirements came up? Um, so I kind of lumped them all into this, into this category. Can I gain muscle? Absolutely. Yes. Now, this all comes down to basically your um, goals and what that, that purpose is and what you've defined where you want to be in your life. If your pure goal, and I shouldn't say like your pure goal, your main goal is to gain muscle and to just bulk up, you're going to see that um, you're, you're going to need to supplement protein. Like we're probably going to push you more to that one gram per pound or up to like the 1.2 grams per pound. Like it's a lot of protein, but mainly on, and, and this lots of different research on this too, but, um, you can still get your fiber because you're going to be eating a lot of those plant sources and calories and carbohydrates that, that are giving you the fuel in a fiber form. So whether we're looking at grains like, um, rice, or we can look at quinoa or, plant sources like beans, legumes, those kind of things, you're still going to get a lot of, um, you're still going to be able to eat really healthy. And one of the things that I'd like to mention here too, is there is some pretty cool research to say, and, and kind of like, uh, depending on what you're doing activity wise during the day, like let's say you're doing strength training, you'll probably need more carbohydrates on that day to help build muscle. 
on the days that you're not strength training, we can focus heavily on the protein and fat because your body's a little bit more sedentary just by default. You, we don't have the same rest and repair and trauma that we've induced to the muscles. So can you gain muscle while eating healthy? Can I still hit my protein goals? Yes. You'll probably have to supplement protein or just eat a lot of a certain type of food. That's just protein dense. Usually that's animal protein. You can do it. Um, with, with, uh, plant sources, it's just a little bit more work and there's great resources out there. One of them would be rich roll is a, is an athlete that is, is endurance athlete that is 100% plant-based. So he's a great resource. If you're looking for something like that, how can I eat healthy with escalating food prices? Yeah, this is on everybody's to do or, or everybody's, uh, brain right in the front of the mind, because we've seen that inflation has gone way up. This is where we just have to be mindful. Um, honestly, we do a lot of our shopping like in bulk. So like at Costco, there hasn't been, it, they have gone up, but there's a lot of foods, especially when you're buying um, produce and you're buying foods just in their pure form where the price hasn't changed that much. Um, frozen foods is a great way to go with organic. They can be picked in season, whether it's vegetables or fruits, frozen foods is a good option. Farmers markets that are local, especially if you go toward the end of the day, when they just want to off put all of their produce, or if you go consistently so that they know who you are and that you're going to be there every single week, they're more readily willing to, to offer you a discount because you know them. Um, we also like to buy in bulk elsewhere. AzureStandard.com is a great one that you can use. They do a drop ship next to you nationwide once a month um, where you can get um, food in bulk and it, you can buy organic and all the things there. And the other thing to keep in mind with that is there are the foods that we want to be really mindful of, like um, the Dirty Dozen. Those ones we should probably buy organic. If, if you're looking at produce that falls into that Clean 15 category from the Environmental Working Group, we can be a little bit more um, judgmental on where we're going to spend our food, our, our money, right? So there are ways to do it, um, but it does look like the foods that have taken the biggest hit in inflation, at least from my standpoint, are the foods that have multiple steps, like we've talked about, multiple steps of handling and multiple steps of processing, because there's just more hands in the pot that, that have to get paid. So produce it's it's gone up just not as much as say like a, a package of oreos or something so you can still do it how many servings of fruit and vegetables do i need every day again this depends on your goal one of the focuses that i would love to have is not have you so dependent on how much do i need to get as much as this is the lifestyle that i'm building and even though we've talked about like um protein and all of those things and how much is required Really, we're looking at building a lifestyle of health. Um, so if this depends, you can get up to 10 servings of vegetables a day or fruits and veggies, depending on what you need. Usually a serving is about a cup of either one of those. Um, but I certainly don't want this to be the stressful part, like especially if you're working with a healthcare provider and you're trying to combat autoimmune, especially like MS, and you've looked at something like Dr. Terry Walls and the Walls Protocol. She really encourages 10 servings of vegetables every single day because we have to have that to help support the body overcome a lot of these issues. So it kind of depends on, on your, your goals and that, that overall vision of, of where you're looking. Um, you can never go wrong. The more, the better. I hate to give you a number because I don't want you to fixate on, oh, this is all I can eat, or I'm failing because I'm not reaching that goal. It's a journey and it's a process and if you're eating more vegetables and fruits than you did the day before or the week before or the month before, we're winning. We're getting there. So do I need to count macros? No. Um, the other question that accompanied this is how many carbohydrates do I need in my diet? Um, again, depends on your goals. If you're trying to, to really just lean out, you probably would need to count macros. Most of us are not. We just want to feel healthy. And we want to make this as, as streamlined as possible. I do think it's beneficial to do it every now and then. It's not something that I do every day. I think the last time I counted macros was um, about two years ago when I did a stint of about three months to remind myself, this is about how many calories I'm eating. This is how many grams of protein is in a chicken breast. This is the you know fiber that I'm getting from my foods. So it is a really good idea to 
to do every now and then just to know where you're at. And in fact, one of the recommendations you could follow would be try a three day food log and then go like, don't change anything and then go back and just plug them into an app like, uh, like my fitness pal or something like that, or, or my plate where it'll give you your macros and all of the, the breakdown without you having to do a lot of work and just see, you might see some blaring holes of like, Oh, wow. I had no idea. I didn't get that much protein. As far as carbohydrates go, those are usually the last one to get filled on the plate. We look at protein, we look at fat, carbohydrates, fill in the rest. Yeah, Lori. Hey, Brandon, we've had a couple of questions in the chat regarding, um, does the apple cider vinegar and lemon water break a fast? Oh, good question. No, it does not. That does not break your fast. Uh, usually when you're looking at fasting, and we'll talk about this on that next slide too, uh, foods that aren't... Um, that don't have calories or don't have many calories aren't going to break your fast. So yeah, you can go ahead and do that. In fact, when I do pro more prolonged fasting, the 72 to hundred hours, I still incorporate apple cider vinegar. I'll still do some lemon water because you need something sometimes or herbal teas. You can even do bone broth. None of that will break your fast. Great question. In fact, a lot of times it's beneficial. You'll get a lot of, um, even including something like salt in your water to make sure you're electrolyte rich all wonderful and do not break your fast. Yeah, good question. How do I eat protein first? Is that weird? Like well, that was a big question, right? Like, so I just eat my chicken and then I eat my rice and then I eat my salad. Um, yes and no. Uh, yeah, it depends. Again, it depends on your goals. If our goals is to really just to, and, and really we're looking at a couple things. One is your goal and one would be um, food timing. If we really want to regulate blood sugar, if we really want to hit that satiety cue sooner, yes, we want to eat protein first. If you're like me, um, I just like all of my food blended together. Like no matter what I'm eating, I will put my salad in with my chicken, with my rice or with my beans or with my quinoa, whatever we're doing, I just mix it all together because I just like it more. I like my food a little bit like sauces are, are a favorite. I love making sauces. Um, so do you need to eat protein first? Is it weird? Maybe at first it's weird, um, but pretty soon it's it's not. And really what I like to do is I'll fill my plate in that order. I'll put my protein on first because your eyes are usually biggest as you're loading your plate first. So my protein, my fats, avocado, whatever it is, maybe some nuts and seeds, and then your carbohydrates are last. I'll put lots of, lots of veggies, make sure that that's a big portion of your meal. That way, when you mix them together, um, you're still getting a really good ratio of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. I don't want it to be something that you stress about um, unless your goals are, I want to just, I want to biohack everything that I possibly can to lose weight and to give myself the best option of managing blood sugar, decreasing appetite, then yeah, let's go for the protein first and eat your chicken first. Um, or if you need something with it, mix it with the veggies because they're just low carbohydrates, right? So they're mainly just fiber. So that's what I would, would recommend on there. What is a sample day of nutrition like? Really good question there. Um, oh, and I, sorry, I was looking at my notes too. When we're looking at protein, like I mentioned before, you can do it with animal fats. You can do it with, um, you can do it with uh, plant or animal proteins, you can do it with plant proteins. Some of the benefits to animal proteins is you're getting a complete um, amino acid profile where you, you there's nine essential amino acids that help break or build muscle. Um, obviously, if you're eating a piece of muscle that has the great ratios that you need to build your own muscle, usually leucine is a little bit higher. Plants, sometimes we don't see a complete uh, amino acid profile or we just don't see the, the complete proteins, those essential aminos in the right um, in the right ratios to build muscle as much as we want to. Again, that probably doesn't matter in the long run, unless your goals are just to build on muscle and, and to bulk, um, because, and benefits of other things that you'll see from animal protein is their nutrient rich. You're going to get a higher protein per calorie ratio than you will with plants, um, with zinc, iron, you know, the omega threes, all of that stuff. It's a lot to unpack. I know. Pro, uh, animal protein though is, is great. You're still going to get your, and one of the questions says, Hey, I feel like I get fuller with animal protein longer. Part of the reason I think that would be, would be because of that protein leverage hypothesis where your body's looking for protein first. 
And it just feels fuller on an animal protein because of that complete amino acid profile. doesn't mean we should avoid plants. We should definitely eat plants and they should take up a bulk of our plate because of all of the benefits that we've talked about on day one and, you know, sporadically through this. Okay. I'll, I, all I'm going to do for a sample nutrition is show you that there's options out there. And I'm going to have Lori post some, some recommendations there. One of them comes from a, an endurance athlete named Ben Greenfield. Um, and his, his option of just some sample diets that you can follow and, and what that would look like on a day-to-day -day basis. Or there's one that's um, from the IFM, the core food plan, um, which is a great way to, to look at not only like a shopping list, but what a breakdown of, of food looks like. You probably won't see a lot of carbohydrate or macro counting in there because again, we want to build a lifestyle where you don't have to do that. So I would just follow those links for like a sample day of nutrition. Man, that was one, that was day one. <laughs> and I have five minutes. So before I go on, just in case somebody has to go on, get off it, it um, we'll come back to all of these. I want to touch base on where do you go from here and why are we doing this? The first and foremost, the reason that we did this five-day course is to provide you content. A lot of times we have questions and we just don't know where to turn. And I hope that I've given you enough information over the last today to five days that you're like, oh, I understand how a lot of this stuff is impacting my life, is impacting my health, and I, I can address areas that I need to change. If that's what you need, awesome. Like that's, that's where we want you to go from here and take this information and run with it. Other people are wondering, man, this is like drinking from a fire hose. How do I unpack all of this? And how do I make sure that I'm, I'm doing what I need to do? Um, that's where functional medicine comes into play. And that's where things like our mastery metabolism, six month program really shine. It's physician directed, it's research backed. We've spent hours and hours and hundreds of hours to build this program so that we can drop just um, drop this information right into your lap in a drip system day by day so that we don't have to overload you and overwhelm you in a course of, of five days. Just imagine what we've covered in these last five days. There's so much information and, um, and it's neat to see that there's so many things that we can focus on. And, and we've just found that it's a lot better to have a support system in place and to have it in a in a receive the information in a way that it's easy to apply so that we can help you along your journey. So that at the end of a six month program, you can look back and say, holy smokes, I have learned so much. We give you the step-by-step -step directions. You get daily emails with simple tasks to keep you on point. You get a one-on-one -on -one health coach with Lori and she'll, she'll help you establish that vision. She'll help you um, ex what, build expectations for the program and what, what we can change in your life. And then you get to jump on a weekly call with Lori and your new cohort and everybody that's working to do this together. Our next one starts on April 3rd and, and it's going to be a lot of fun and it's super informative. And just as an overview, like we go through everything plus so much more that we've talked about in these last five days over the course of six months to really help you implement it and build a lifestyle of, of health and change. And it's something that we've seen a lot of benefit from from our patients. In fact, here's a couple of things that, that some of our, our previous patients in these cohorts that have, have said that having the health coach there, being able to glean off her knowledge and her information was so important. Not only that, but also helping and listening, getting help and being able to listen to people in the class so that you're, you're doing it together. That's what it's all about. And I can't believe how fortunate I am to be part of this course. It was way far more than I ever thought it would be. So much information. So if this is something that's that's intriguing to you, there's a couple different ways that, that we can go about it. One is you've been with me for five days. I, I definitely want to offer you a discount on our programs, but I also want to make sure that this is something that you can do. And I'll have Lori put a link in the, in the um, chat today of a link that you can follow to fill out just a simple questionnaire on your metabolic health one that helps you identify what your goals would probably be and really establish that vision in a simple way and where your starting point is at. And then jump on a phone call with me, 15 minute phone call, it's free. We can talk about what the next best steps for you would be, whether you want to just continue on your own or if I can offer you a, an amazing way to start and we can dive deep into labs and, and look at that health nutrition in an individualized, personalized basis, then I'm more than happy to do that. So from there, 
we can talk about how to sign up for the program and everything like that. I just wanted to make sure that you had that information um, just in case anybody had to jump off at, at 1230. So, um, so please reach out. I'm happy to talk to you about any, like, let's, let's get together and let's have that 15 minute chat. Okay. Let's jump back in to your questions on these. The next ones were on fasting. Can I practice intermittent fasting with adrenal fatigue? Uh, short answer is yes, you can. Um, yes. Does fasting impact stress on the adrenals? Absolutely. It increases stress, but it's in the same way that, that, um, exercise does that holding your breath does like good stress, positive stress. And let me scroll back up on my notes here too. Um, yeah. So, um, what I, what I found in the research was that fasting helps pull out a lot of the oxidative stress that the body's receiving. It just helps alleviate a lot of that burden. So over time, we can actually help heal those adrenals with something like intermittent fasting. It also just helps decrease the inflammation because we're giving those cells time to turn inward, clean themselves out. That cellular autophagy takes over. So yes, you can still practice um, intermittent fasting, even, even with adrenal fatigue. The, the key is we're not going to jump into a hundred hour fast right away, right? Like this is going to be, we're going to build up gradually and we're going to see how you feel as we go. <clears throat> so make it a process. Don't just jump into it right away. Even if we're starting with eight to 12 hours as your fasting time, and we're building up to that 12 to 16 hours or, you know, prolonged fasts. Can I skip breakfast while intermittent fasting? Essentially, the, a lot of questions were, what if I eat lunch and dinner and then fast? I start my fast in the evening. I fast all the way to lunch. Can you do that? Yes, you can. Now, the research does show that eating breakfast and lunch is so much better, partly because there's even been research studies that look at eating the exact same thing for breakfast as you do for dinner and what that does to your resting metabolic rate and how fast your body is able to digest it. It just does better in the morning where we're gearing up for the day instead of gearing down to rest. So it has less of an impact on your body by eating it in the morning than it does in the evening. So um, again, if we're trying to optimize everything, eating breakfast and lunch is better. However, even when you, when you look at Dr. Jason Fung stuff, and I'll have Lori Stick put some, some recommendations, like a video from him, we're going back to that consistency that's what's the most important. When I intermittent fast, I skip breakfast and I start with lunch and I eat dinner because I don't want to miss out on that dinner time and that family time with my kids and my wife. So, and it's the same with Dr. Fung. Like he's like, yes, I know the research shows that breakfast is better to eat. And we start our day off um, eating well. And breakfast is my favorite time, of, my favorite meal. Like those are all the best foods. I love oatmeal and, and all of those things. Um, but if I'm practicing intermittent fasting just because of time with the family, um, I usually start at noon and it doesn't mean you have to. So really we're looking at consistency, do what's best for you. What do I do about hunger? Like I just get crazy hungry when I fast to the point that I feel sick. This is where we really start um, to go slow. We, we just build up as, as slow as we can. Um, and remember that there's other ways that we can mitigate hunger on while we're eating. One of those things could be using things like lemon tea, apple cider vinegar, bone broth. You could even do some chia seeds because they're going to just fill up that stomach. They're going to absorb water and just make a gel so that you don't feel as hungry. Um, what we do see is that your body in the morning, you're, you're, um, you're, a, you're ready to eat essentially. Like you've been burning stuff through the night. You're probably not as hungry. Um, so it shouldn't, be, you should be able to fast longer, um, that way, just from a hormone standpoint, once we start to eat, then we're, we're triggering those hormones. Um, but that would be my main recommendation with hunger is just start slow and realize that it's going to be a, a process. Does a pre-workout break my fast? No, most of them are, um, zero calorie. My, my question there really would be, why are you taking a pre-workout? What's the, like, identify your purpose. If, is it supplying energy? If it is how, like, are we dependent on caffeine to get through our, our workouts, um, over time, that's probably just going to increase like hormone, um, disruption, um, you know, other negative effects that, that 
aren't. So if that's the case, if we're looking for energy and it's a cardio workout, I'd probably just recommend something like an essential aminos um, source. And Kion does a great, uh, they have a great K-I-O-N. They do a great essential aminos that I would recommend just taking 30 minutes before a workout. And you'll probably get a lot less of, of whatever's in, you know, most pre-workouts have a weird flavor, like um, depending on the, the pre-workout, right? They're usually caffeine and flavoring. So um, branch chain amino acids, I don't really recommend. It's like just drinking glorified flavored water. Um, essential aminos seem to do a lot better. I would, yeah, Lori. Sorry. I just nope. didn't mean to interrupt. So just, Anytime. Uh, another question about breaking the fast though. How about bone broth? Is that considered a break in a fast? Good question. No, it's not. You can do bone broth for sure. Um, there is stuff in the research that looks at um, when I'm doing bone, like cellular autophagy, do I get more if I'm doing a pure water fast than I do with bone broth? You probably do. Um, but it doesn't break your, your fast completely. So again, that's one of those where What's going to be best for you? Is it easier to do the fast when you're having bone broth incorporated? Then yeah, use it. I usually do because it, that electrolyte balance just makes me feel better while we're fasting. Um, so yeah, I would look at essential aminos for a pre-workout. Decide why it is that you're actually taking them. If it is to build muscle, essential aminos after a strength workout, like an hour after, usually does better than a pre-workout. Um, if you need the energy, I would look at something like that. On motion. How can I increase time outside during the winter? Yeah, I would say one of the things here is just manage expectations. Um, know that extremes and temperatures are good for us, which is why we talked about cold showers, saunas, that kind of thing. So it's okay to be cold, but also know if it's a blizzard or it's snowy and it's just wet, we, you probably won't want to just go outside and we want you to bundle up and stay warm know that you're probably not going to get the vitamin D that we want as much as we just want you to be in nature to help with the grounding, to help with the stress, to get that big picture, the visual stimulations that are going to help support stress. Um, and, and yeah, manage expectations, dress warm would probably be some of those things that I would look at um, and be okay with probably a decreased amount of time. And then when the sun is out or when the weather is okay, take full advantage of it. And it's okay if it's not balanced, you know, 30 minutes every day, and we, we have to do a give and take with mother nature. That's okay. How can I increase movement working from home? This is probably all the things that, that we'll look at to decrease sedentary behavior, increasing your water, look to do a standing desk or doing squats while you're brushing your teeth or changing up our, our patterns of going up the stairs backwards or habit stacking, changing positions while you're sitting, using an exercise ball to work from a computer, whatever it takes um, just to get physical activity into your life more would be my answer there. And, oh, there was one other question that I didn't have listed. And this was, this was one that was overall, this, this was a question of tell me more about the program. And we covered that. The last question would be, um, and I'll just take, I'll let you see me for this. Ha. My last question for this would be, um, how can I tell if what I'm doing is working? If weight loss isn't initial and there's other things going on behind the scenes, as far as we've talked about the micronutrient deficiencies or stress or sleep, how do I know that I'm making progress? How can I get those small wins to keep myself motivated enough to, to move forward? And what I would say on that is it just depends on, again, on our vision. Like we want to always make that our, our gold standard of where we're going. Why are you doing what you're doing? Are we getting closer to that objective? So if we can see that progress, awesome. So there's a lot of subjective ways that we can look at that. Do I have better energy? Is my mood and temperament better? Do I feel like I have a better willpower battery throughout the day? Like I'm able to resist sweets or, you know, by the end of the day, I just don't feel like a, whatever, just give me anything. Those would be all more subjective. You can also do more objective measurements um, at home that would look at looking at a scale or body fat percentages or hip to waist measurements or things like that. Or the other option is you jump in and you work with a provider and we track your labs and we make sure that when we're looking at those things and inflammation markers, uh, vitamin deficiencies, mineral deficiencies, hormones that they're all trending in the right way. And we just spot check labs as we go every three months or so, so that we know that what you're doing and what you're taking and what you're eating is working. 
Um, that's probably the most objective way if you want to see concrete data. Um, there are ways that you can do that on your own as well. Um, like you can check, you can request your own labs through something like any lab test now. Uh, but I would recommend working with a provider just because they're going to be able to walk you through that in, in so much better detail and, and give you recommendations and things like that. So um, that's it. I think that's the end of our questions. We made it. I kept you longer today. I apologize, but I'm glad we got to cover your, your questions as well as well as talk about where to go from here. Are there any last minute questions that people have um, in the chat? I'll give you a minute to think too, but I just want to tell you, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to spend time with us every single day. I know it's a sacrifice. Time is a very valuable commodity. And I'm so grateful that you've spent the time with us to, to be here with us. I mean, your energy and your positivity, just being here, even if you were a passive viewer helps a lot. And it means a lot. Um, we are here for you in any way that we can be. We want to be your cheerleaders. Even if we never talk to you in person, just know that we're rooting for you because this is a journey that we are all on together. And we want to help support that in any way that we can, whether it's seeing you on future webinars and we can offer you more information on, on, how to achieve other areas of health in your life. So you can, you're welcome to throw things in the comments on, on future com or future topics that you'd like to see. Um, all the way up to working with us personally um, with a physician or like a provider relationship. We're happy to be that as well. And like I said, if you have any questions, please fill out that questionnaire jump and it once you fill out that questionnaire it'll take you to my calendar you can throw yourself on on there so that we can have a 15 minute chat and just see where you're at and see if what we do would be a great fit for you and we'll go from there and if you're already a patient of resolve medical just reach out to us through the portal say hey i want to talk more about this and we can definitely do that as well so again thank you i hope you all have a wonderful day it's been a I know it's a busy day. It's Friday. Kids are out of school early. So spring break's coming up. Lori. A couple of questions, Brandon. Um, one is regarding if you have a recommendation for protein supplements. And oh, sure. then a second one also you'll see there from Jenny regarding um, grams of protein per day. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, protein supplement recommendation. Yeah, this depends on on how you do. I, I like to change it up. I do both whey protein and I do um, um, plant based protein. The reason I choose whey and I still do organic and a grass fed source of whey protein that's clean. It doesn't have anything else. It's just raw. One, it's easily digestible. It has a high protein to calorie count, so it's mainly protein. The ratios between those essential aminos are are high, so it's high leucine content. Um, and yeah, it just seems to be readily available too. Like you can get a really good clean sourced whey protein. I do like throwing in something like, um, the name just escaped me. Um, oh, warrior sun warrior, sun warrior protein. They make some great plant-based proteins as well. I like the variety. <clears throat> um, usually you have to kind of to see where you're at with, with calories as well. If sometimes you're just going to get a higher calorie count through some of those, that's why I like whey because it's going to be more, um, if you don't do dairy, I would definitely look at, at something. And again, I think the clean sources are, are worth it. Um, let me look back at that thing, your comment on protein, Jenny to 165 to 210. Yeah. So the comments on that general rule of thumb, we look at body weight. Sometimes you can look at, at your, um, um, uh, fat-free mass, like your muscle mass to, to base protein off of as well. Um, it's one of those where I'm not, especially if we're getting a lot of different foods, like your, your plant foods, and we have a, a good variety of, of plant foods in the diet, you're going to get your essential amino acids in pieces that aren't all just in like those grams of protein. So it's not something that I stress so much about if we're following all of those things first of like, I'm making sure that I'm prioritizing protein in my food. I'm eating it first so that I, I feel that satiety, um, focusing on sleep and hydration and toxins and all of these things. That's usually enough. Um, 
Yeah. The other one is you can always look to see what it would be at the, like the lowest recommendation of like 0.35 grams per pound and start there and see how that feels. Um, yeah. If it's, if it's too much, it's too much. That is a lot though, for sure. Other questions? Okay. Well, thanks so much, everybody. It's been a wonderful time and I'm excited. We'll do this again in the future and I'm excited to see you then. Have a wonderful weekend and let us know if there's anything we can do for you.